fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. It is an honor to be here at the Compass Conference once again. How many have been to one of my previous sessions before or seen one of my videotapes? Okay, how many never have? And how many do not understand the questions so far? <laughs> All right, well, good. Well, as he said, my name's Ken Hoven. I taught high school science for 15 years. Uh, Brother Bill, I don't guess I don't understand this apologetics stuff, okay? I don't apologize at all. I believe the Bible is literally true and scientifically accurate, and I think the evolution theory that's being taught in our schools is one of the dumbest and most dangerous religions on planet Earth. Okay. So, with, with that said, let's get started. This is not my wife. That's just a picture of her. Uh, <laughs> Last summer was our 31st anniversary, and we sat down and figured out how much money we've spent since we got married. We have spent all of it. And praise God, she's with me here out at the table this week. You get to see my wife. She doesn't get to travel much. She's real involved in music at our church, and so you stop in and see her. We live in Pensacola, Florida. Been there for 16 years, and we have three kids, one of each. And I got all my kids married off, and the dog died, so I made it. I'm home free. It's wonderful. And we got three and a half grandkids, and for those who don't know, grandkids are God's reward for not killing your own kids when you thought about it. <laughs> Hang in there. It'll be worth it all. Amen. All right. And all three of my kids and their spouses work in our ministry and all live right around us. God's given us an amazing staff. We've got uh, Creation Science Evangelism and Dinosaur Adventure Land. We have an awesome time down there. A museum, theme park, and science center based on creation instead of evolution. I wish there were thousands of those across the country. So at Bill's request, we're covering today more reasons why evolution is stupid. Now, let me define some terms and some positions. I believe the Bible teaches very clearly, and I believe the scientific evidence points very clearly to this earth being instantly created in six days, about 6,000 years ago, and a great big flood about 4,400 years ago that completely destroyed the world and dropped everybody's property value to zero. And then Jesus came 2,000 years ago, and so that's the top timeline, and that's the position I take, and I believe that's true and defensible scientifically. The evolution theory says 20 billion years ago there was a big bang where nothing exploded and made everything. And then 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down and developed a hard rocky crust, and it rained on the rocks for millions of years and turned them into soup, and the soup came alive about 3 billion years ago. And that first life form found somebody to marry, yeah, that's a good trick of course, and something to eat, and slowly evolved into everything we see today. I think the evolution theory is not defensible scientifically. Let's define some more terms here. Stupid. <laughs> Lacking normal intelligence. <laughs> Foolish. Silly. A stupid idea. Now, I was taught by my mommy, don't use the word stupid, okay? So when Bill said, preach on why evolution is stupid, I said, that's going to be easy to do, but it's going to be hard because it's been entrained in me since I was a little bitty. You know, you don't use that word. So I don't want to belittle anybody who believes in evolution here today, and I'm sure there are quite a few. That's fine. Uh, it's just not a common sense idea. It doesn't make sense. The things about evolution just simply are lacking normal intelligence. And we want to fix that today. Now, I collect science books. I taught science 15 years. I happen to love the subject. Stephen... Uh, Richard Dawkins said, it's absolutely safe to say if you meet someone who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid, or insane, or wicked. Folks, there is a battle going on, okay? Whether you realize it or not, whether you understand it or not, there's a war going on in our culture, and there are two basic sides. One side says, God made this world, He owns it, He makes the rules. The other side said, nobody makes this world, there are no rules, and it's a real war going on, and I'm right smack in the middle of it and helping to stir it up occasionally. Okay, so let's define some more terms here. The word evolution has at least six different meanings. First, we'd have to have cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, matter, the Big Bang, okay? Secondly, we'd have to have chemical evolution. That's where all of the elements are evolved from hydrogen. I think that's silly. We'll talk about that in a minute. Thirdly, there'd have to be stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Cosmic evolution, st chemical evolution, and stellar evolution. There's a lot of stars out there. The last estimate, 19, in 2003, the most recent estimate is there are enough stars out there right now that we know about that everybody on planet Earth can own 11 trillion of them to yourself. 
Those are the ones we know about. We don't know about the ones that we don't know about. <laughs> Fourthly, there's going to have to be organic evolution. Somewhere, somehow, life has to get started from non-living material. Okay? Fifthly, there'd have to be macroevolution, where an animal changes into a different kind of animal. And lastly, microevolution. I object to the term, but they use it. So I believe in number six. That happens. I think variations happen within the kinds, but the first five are purely religious. I think, fr quite frankly, they're stupid. Okay? Let's cover them here. Look at each of the first five. Textbook says, 18 to 20 billion years ago, all the matter in the universe was concentrated into one very dense, very hot region that may have been much smaller than a period on this page. That's stupid. And then there was a big bang where this little tiny dot exploded. That's stupid, okay? They don't tell you where the time came from, where the space came from, where the matter came from, where the energy came from. They just assume all of that is inherent in this little bitty dot, which came from nothing. Who's ever seen a big bang create order? Hmm? Big bangs don't create order. That's stupid. Big bangs create big messes. The Humanist Manifesto says, Humanists regard the universe as self-existing and not created. Well, the second law of thermodynamics tells us everything is falling apart. If you leave something alone for a while, it's going to rot, rust, die, break down, or fall apart. Nothing gets better by itself. To, so to say that the universe is self-existing is stupid, okay? It violates the second law of thermodynamics. Evolutionists say, well, yeah, you can add energy, though, and overcome the second law. And they say the earth is an open system. It receives energy from the sun. I understand. But the universe is a closed system by definition. Secondly, adding energy is destructive. There has to be something to utilize the energy, Adding energy is going to make it worse, okay? The Japanese added all kind of, kinds of energy to Pearl Harbor one day. They didn't organize nothing for us. A couple of years later, we returned the favor and added energy to a few of their cities, didn't we? Yeah. Adding energy is destructive. So the sun's energy is going to destroy the roof on your house. It'll destroy your entire house. The sun's energy will destroy the roof on your car. It'll destroy the paint job on your car. Adding energy is not the solution. You have to have intelligently directed and harnessed energy. So to say that you can overcome the second law by adding energy is stupid. It's just not that simple. Evolutionists assume that if you give enough time, things get better. That's silly, okay? You give things time, they get worse. Here's Sue at 20. <laughs> Here she is at 90. Okay? They, don't, they don't get better. <laughs> Textbook says nothing really means nothing. That's stupid. Not only matter and energy would disappear, but also space and time. However, physicists theorize that from the state of nothingness, the universe began in a gigantic explosion. Yes, boys and girls, you see, one day nothing exploded. And here we are. I, there's no kind way to say it, okay? That's stupid. That's lacking normal intelligence, all right? Here's Discover Magazine a couple years ago. Where did everything come from? Boys and girls, the universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero. Nada. As it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. That's real stupid. Yeah. The observable universe could have evolved from an infinitesimal region, this guy said. It's then tempting to go one step further and speculate that the entire universe evolved from literally nothing. It all came from a dot. That's stupid. I'm sorry, it just is, okay? So the Bible says, in the beginning, which is reference to time, which, by the way, has three dimensions, past, present, future, a trinity, and you can't escape time. God created the heaven, that's space, which has three dimensions, length, width, height. You can't escape space. Where can you be where you're not in space or in time? You can't escape them. It permeates everything. And God created the earth. You know, matter comes in three dimensions, solid, liquid, gas. We have a trinity of trinities in, one, in, ten, in ten words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Time, space, matter. All three have to come into existence at the same instant. If you had matter but had no space, where would you put it? If you had matter but had no time, when would you put it? Hmm? You have to have all three simultaneously. People say, what did God do for millions of years before the creation? Well, your question assumes that God is stuck in time, space, matter. We are the ones stuck in time, space, matter. He's not stuck in those. See, if God was limited by time, he's not God. This is not 2004 in heaven. There is no time in heaven. And before the creation, there was no time. So once upon a time, there was a time when there was no time. Think about that one. Anyway. 
So when the textbook says nothing really means nothing, that's stupid, okay? Uh, it's just not common sense. None of these things can create themselves. Time, space, and matter cannot create themselves. They have to have an outside force, like an all-wise, all-powerful, almighty, infinite God to create those things. Then the textbook says this little tiny dot was spinning. It spun faster and faster. Yes, boys and girls, and one day it exploded. <laughs> Big bang. Well, if you take a merry-go-round, put some kids on there, get the merry-go-round going <laughs> clockwise as fast as it'll go, the kids go through distinct phases. In phase one, they're screaming at the football players. Come on, let's go faster, faster. You get up around, you know, 30 miles an hour. <laughs> they go to phase two, where they stop screaming. Then you get going faster and you get around 60 miles an hour, they start screaming again. But now they're screaming, stop, stop, please slow down. When you get up around 100 miles an hour, you enter phase four where the kids begin to fly off the merry-go-round. <laughs> now when the kid flies off, you notice something interesting. As the kid is flying off the merry-go-round, if the merry-go-round is going clockwise, the kid, even after he leaves, is spinning clockwise until he encounters resistance like a tree or telephone pole. That's because of a law known as the conservation of angular momentum. A spinning object that breaks apart will send all the fragments off spinning in the same direction. And people say, well, what if they collide? They can't collide. The, farther, the longer you wait, the further apart they get. It's like spokes on a wheel. They're getting farther apart. If a hanger net explodes, can the fragments ever hit each other out in the field someplace? No, <laughs> it doesn't happen, okay? Conservation of angular momentum says spinning objects break apart and the fragments fly the same direction, spin the same direction. So when they tell you that it all came from a spinning dot, it's silly. It violates common sense laws. Two planets, Venus and Uranus, are spinning backwards. Eight of the 91 known moons are spinning backwards. Three planets have moons going both directions at the same time. Some whole galaxies are spinning backwards. CNN, goofy galaxy spins wrong direction. <laughs> the Big Bang Theory is stupid, okay? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So when they tell you it spun faster and faster and one day it exploded, that's simply stupid, okay? That's not the way it happened. So we have cosmic evolution, which I think is silly. Then we have, um, the, the textbook says, as the earth formed, the surface was hot and there were large pools of bubbling lava. Was the earth ever a hot molten mass like the textbook says? The Bible says the Spirit of God moved on the face of the waters. The Bible says God created it cold, not hot. See, everything about the evolution theory is backwards to the Bible. Don't try to compromise those two, okay? like trying to ride two horses going but different directions, same time, okay? Uh, Robert Gentry's got a great book on the uh, radio, uh, radio polonium halos. Uh, Gentry's a brilliant man. I think he's spoken at the conference, hasn't he? Uh, I've spoken with him at a couple conferences. I don't know if it was stealing the mind or not, but uh, brilliant man, lives in near Knoxville, Tennessee. He's done lots of study on the granites around the world. The granites all contain these radio polonium halos, which have an extremely short half-life, proving they were never a hot molten mass. But these radio polonium halos tell us absolutely positively the earth was never a hot molten mass. And if you melt granite and let it cool back down, it doesn't form into granite again. Nobody knows for sure how granite was made. So when the textbook says the earth was a hot molten mass, I'm sorry, that's stupid. It's not true. It's lacking normal intelligence. It didn't happen that way. Secondly, we'd have to have what's, or thirdly, with chem secondly, yeah, uh, chemical evolution. All the elements forming from hydrogen. They think it all came from a big bang. Atoms of hydrogen in the proto-sun were fused together to form helium. Okay, I'll agree that can happen. But it's stupid to think that's going to form all the elements. They say, well, yeah, you can fuse and get, you know, hydrogen fuses to helium. I agree. And you can't fuse past iron, though. It won't go past iron. How do you get, you, you tell me you got uranium from hydrogen? I'd like to see that, please. It's not, it's lacking normal intelligence. It just doesn't happen. Chemically, it's not possible. Thirdly, there'd have to be what's called stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. The Bible says, God made the stars. Plain and simple, that's just what it says. Textbook says, 18 to 20 billion years ago was the Big Bang which caused the formation of galaxies. Well, we got a real serious problem here. Big Bang theory says nothing got together and exploded while it was spinning and formed all these galaxies. Well, Problems are multitude for this theory, okay? Some think the Big Bang Theory made nice, neat, orderly galaxies. That's stupid, okay? These galaxies are really incredibly designed. Even at the galaxy level, there's design in the universe, all the way down to the molecular level. We see a star blow up about every 30 years. A star explodes. It's called a nova or a supernova. If, supernova, if the universe is billions of years old, why are there less than 300 supernova rings ever discovered? That's only a few thousand years worth. I mean, if a star is blowing up every 30 years, there ought to be millions of these supernova rings if the universe were millions of years old. 
Don't tell me it's millions of years old. I don't believe you. That's just not common sense. They say, well, yeah, new stars are forming. They say, this textbook says, new stars are constantly being born in clouds of gas and dust. First of all, that's not ever observed, okay? The silent embarrassment of modern astrophysics is we do not know how even a single one of these stars managed to form. You can't get dust and squeeze it together and make a star. There are common sense laws that overcome that, like Boyle's gas law. You try to squeeze the gas together, the pressure builds up and it drives it back apart. Nobody ever sees gases form into solids by their own internal gravitational force. So if, star, if stars evolve, star births should at least equal star deaths. And we're seeing one die every 30 years, and we're never seeing one form. One guy said, oh, we're seeing a star form right now in Crab Nebula. I said, no, you're not. He said, yeah, we are. I said, no, you're seeing a spot getting brighter. You see a spot, and it's getting brighter, and you're assuming a star is forming. Well, duh, it could be a dust cloud is clearing in front of it. It could be another big bang going off, I mean, a, a supernova going off out there. All you're seeing is a st spot getting brighter. You're assuming it's making a new star. Nobody's ever seen a new star form. Some people think if we lose stars every 30 years and never replace them, this will eventually lead to having 70 sextillion stars. Yeah, you keep spending money, pretty soon you'll be rich. That's stupid, okay? It just is stupid, okay? Uh, some of these planets are cooling off. They're constantly losing their heat, okay? And the textbooks is telling us they're millions of years old, billions of years old. You can't just keep cooling off and cooling off. Pretty soon it's cooled off. <laughs> I mean, if you walked into a room and found a cup of coffee sitting on the table and I said, don't touch the coffee, that's hot. And you said, well, whose is it? I said, I don't know. It's been sitting there for 400 years. <laughs> that's stupid, okay? Jupiter has a moon called Ganymede, which has a very strong magnetic field. Scientists are kind of perplexed by this because the magnetic field indicates a hot molten core, and yet Ganymede should have cooled off billions of years ago. Why does Ganymede still have a hot molten core and a strong magnetic field? To say it's billions of years old is stupid. It's just lacking common intelligence. Saturn has rings around it, but the rings are constantly expanding. They're moving away from the planet. To say they're billions of years old is stupid. They can't be billions of years old. They would have been dissipated by now. They're not billions of years old. The moon is going farther away from the earth every year. We're slowly losing the moon. Now, this is going to be complicated, so listen carefully. As the moon goes around the earth, it's gradually getting farther away. It's spiraling out about three inches a year. So that means that it used to be closer. <laughs> well, if you bring the moon in closer, you start to create a problem, you see, because the moon causes the tides. Now, you folks here in Denver probably don't worry about the tides. <laughs> but in Pensacola, you worry about the tides, okay? Well, if you brought the moon in closer, you'd create a serious problem because there's a law called the inverse square law. If you bring the moon into one-third the distance, you take the one-third, inverse it, square it, it's nine times the gravitational pull. If you run all the math on this, you'll find 1.2 billion years ago, the moon was whizzing around just above the surface of the Earth. <laughs> that explains what happened to the tall dinosaur. They got moon. So to teach us the, earth, the moon is billions of years old while it's constantly moving away and nobody knows of any factors that would reverse that situation, that, that's just stupid, okay? It can't be true. Organic evolution is the fourth stage. That's where life gets started from non-living material. The Bible says God created the living creatures. And there are folks who simply don't want God telling them what to do, bottom line. God, leave me alone, stay out of my life. Okay. So they've got to figure out a way how life got here without involving a supernatural intelligence creating it. The Bible says God created it. This textbook says the history of life on earth began approximately three and a half billion years ago. How this occurred and has been and will continue to be a topic for inquiry. Let me give you the Hovind translation. <clears throat> it's okay to inquire how life evolved. It is not okay to inquire whether it evolved. That's stupid. Is this education or indoctrination? Hey, kids, we know life evolved. Now, you've got to try to figure out how it happened. How about if we even question, did it evolve? Oh, no, you can't question that. You cannot question that. We know it evolved. Now, just figure out how it happened. That's not education. That's indoctrination. Urien Miller in the 1950s wanted to know how the Earth and solar system had come to be. 
At the bottom it says, he never proved how life originated. He did add evidence to the theory that life could have started by itself. Life started by itself. That's stupid, okay? Life cannot start by itself. This textbook says, swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. <laughs> That's stupid. Can you believe they cut down a tree to print that book? <laughs> Where's Al Gore when you need him? Mm. Yeah. Here we have four major magazines and news media, Scientific American, CNN, New Scientist. They're all saying life sprang from clay. Yes, a piece of clay created life. Well, that's stupid. And I think God could take clay and create life, okay? But the clay can't create life from itself. Major difference here, okay? Textbook says, students are taught that life evolved from non-living materials, like this one. Many important events occurred during the Archean era, the most important of which was the evolution of life. Progress from a complex molecule, from complex molecules to even the simplest living organism was a very long process. Yes, boys and girls, you see, long ago, and far away. They hide it in antiquity. Well, if you just imagine, you go back far enough, it happened. Oh, yeah, I must have. This one says, between four and three billion, 3.8 billion years ago, living cells emerged. There's no record of the event. <laughs> That's stupid, okay? The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. Yep, we all came from soup. Now that's stupid. I'm sorry, it just lacks common sense. Ernst Haeckel said, he knew that spontaneous generation must be true, not because it had been proven in the laboratory, but because otherwise it would be necessary to believe in a creator. <laughs> ah, now we're getting to the truth. Well, I'm sorry, Ernst. That's a stupid way to look at life, okay? Have scientists really produced life in the laboratory? Well, they want you to think they have. What they did, they took a series of glass tubes and beakers and flasks and hooked them all together and made four gases go through there. Methane, ammonia, water vapor, and hydrogen. Notice, there's no oxygen. They didn't want oxygen in there. They excluded oxygen. They said, well, maybe the early Earth had what's called a reducing atmosphere. No oxygen present. Well, and then they said, at the bottom of the flask, it collected stuff that was rich in amino acids. That's stupid. It was not rich in amino acids by a long shot. What they did, they took four gases, excluding oxygen. Major problem, because they had to leave oxygen out, because if anything tried to get together, it would oxidize. You know, you cut a banana open, lay it on the table, it turns brown, it oxidizes. You don't paint your car, it rusts, it oxidizes. So he took oxygen out. The problem is, you've you got to have oxygen. See, ozone is made from oxygen, and ozone blocks UV light. So if you take away the oxygen, now the UV light destroys your ammonia, and that's one of the other gases you're trying to use. So you cannot get life to evolve without oxygen. And you cannot get life to evolve with oxygen. Then the earth has always had oxygen. All the experiments are showing that there's no proof of this reducing atmosphere. There's far more oxygen in the past than anybody ever imagined. We find in general no evidence that the earth had an oxygen-free atmosphere. That's what all the scientific exper experiments have shown. Yeah, so life cannot evolve with oxygen. Life cannot evolve without oxygen. And yet they're teaching us life evolved from non-living matter. I'm sorry, that's just stupid. It had to be designed, created by a really smart designer. This textbook says, there was 0% oxygen on the earth, but the rocks absorbed it. <laughs> That's stupid. They filtered out the product in this experiment. Miller and Urey in their experiments had the stuff going through this, this series of tubes. And when it got to the bottom, they, they drained it off because they didn't want it to go through the electric spark chamber again because the spark would tear it apart. They said it's like 100,000 times more likely to destroy it than it was to create it. So they had to protect the goo that they created at the bottom. That's not realistic for nature. I mean, if they're saying life evolved in some warm little pond from lightning strikes, that's just not common sense. Because the lightning strikes 100,000 times more likely to tear it apart than it is to put it together. Go check out your little pond after lightning strikes. See how many frogs are surviving. Hmm? Yeah. <laughs> What he actually made was 85% tar, 13% carboxylic acid. Now, both of those are toxic to life. He made 2% amino acids, and only two of the amino acids were made. There are 20 different amino acids. It's like making two letters of the alphabet accidentally by dropping toothpicks and saying, wow, look at this. Nobody writes books. Here's how they're formed. <laughs> uh, duh. These amino acids bond with tar and, tar and acid much more quickly, quickly than with each other. Amino acids are like letters of the alphabet. They're building blocks to make words, and you've got to have words to make paragraphs and paragraphs to make books. 
What he actually made in the experiment was the equivalent of a couple of letters, two of the letters, and half of them were backwards. <laughs> now you really got a problem because the smallest proteins have 70 to 100 of these amino acids in precise order and they're all left-handed. What's the chances of dropping toothpicks out of an airplane and creating letters on the ground, 70 letters in a row, all facing the right way, all spelled correctly just to make one paragraph? The chances are zero. It's not going to happen. Now, if you believe it will, that's great. I, I admire your faith, but don't call it science. And don't make me pay to put that in the schools like it's part of science. Okay, you go start yourself a private school and teach that junk to anybody that wants to pay and come learn it. This is America, the land of the fee and the home of the slave, so, or whatever. So, now, DNA and RNA are all right-handed molecules, and hundreds of these have to combine in the right order, and they unbond in water much faster than they bond. And as far as I'm concerned, folks, the oceans are completely full of water. <laughs> Brownian motion is going to drive them apart. It is not common sense to say scientists have made life in the laboratory. It's just stupid. They haven't even come close. I was in a debate one time, and this one uh, student in the Q&A time said, Hoven, what are you going to say if scientists ever make life in the laboratory? What are you going to say then? I said, well, first of all, I would like to point out they're a long ways from it. They're nowhere close to creating life. They can't even get uh, just, a, just a couple of these amino acids to combine. Can't even make a protein. He said, well, you're right. I said, now to answer your question, I guess I'd have to say, if a bunch of intelligent scientists get together and create life in the laboratory, that would prove it takes intelligence to make life. <laughs> Which is what I've been saying all along. <laughs> life came from rocks. That's just stupid. It's not common sense, okay? Macroevolution tells us that it can change from one kind of animal into another. Textbook says, yes, boys and girls, bacteria slowly evolve to humans. This one says, all the animals have a common ancestor, early reptile. That's just stupid, okay? Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog, all right? Even Mary Leakey said, those trees of life with their branches of our ancestors is a lot of nonsense. Stephen Gould at Harvard University said, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks are not the evidence of fossils. We don't have any proof of these trees at all. They make it up. They say the mammals and the birds and the crocodiles have a common ancestor. Everything inside that circle is just pure religious speculation. They're guessing. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. You may get a big dog or a little dog, but you get a dog every time. This Irish textbook calls it divergent evolution. Oh, come on, look at it. You got five dogs coming from a wolf. Don't give it a fancy name. It's, not, it's, not a, it's still a dog, okay? That's not evolution. That's stupid to say that's evolution. It's a variety of dog. This Mexican textbook says the horse and the zebra have a common ancestor. I agree. And it looked like a horse. <laughs> Four-wheel drive, genuine leather upholstery. I mean, all the standard equipment, okay? There's a lot of kinds of cows in the world, probably 15 different major varieties of cows, and they might have had a common ancestor. A cow. <laughs> There's a magazine where you can order chickens. Okay, boys and girls, let's order some chickens. Do you want to get cinnamon queens, white red rocks, white rocks, cherry eggers, brown leghorns, golden comets? But then the magazine says, jungle fowl are the original bird from which all varieties and strains of domesticated chickens are derived. Did you know all the chickens had a common ancestor? It was a chicken? Some say, well, that's evolution. No, I'm sorry, that's stupid, okay? It's a variety of chicken, right? There are eight kinds of bears in the world, and they might have had a common ancestor, a bear. So to, say, to take these observations we see, like dogs and wolves having a common ancestor, and saying that is conclusion that we all have a common ancestor, I'm sorry, that's just stupid. It lacks common intelligence, right? Textbook says the horse evolved from a four-toed horse. What they don't tell you about this is the first one had 18 pairs of ribs. It's a meat-eating animal still alive today in East Africa and Turkey, okay? It's about smaller than a fox. It's not a horse. It's, a, it's not, not even related, okay? The next one had 15 pairs of ribs. The next one has 19. They just picked these animals and arranged them in order, okay? The, whole, the horse, horse evolution series is stupid. It's never observed today. There's a huge variety of horses today. We've got big horses and little horses right now. And the horse evolution series was proven wrong in 1950. Even G.G. Simpson, who believed very strongly in evolution, says, look, folks, it's not true. It's wrong. Take this out of the textbooks. It never happened in nature. But they still keep this in the textbooks. And they know it hasn't held up to examination, but they don't have any replacement evidence. 
Othniel Marsh made up this entire horse evolution idea in 1874. He made it up. He picked animals from all over the world. Horses, modern horses are found in layers with the so-called ancient horses. The ancient horse, the Hyracotherum, is not even a horse. It's just like a hyrax still alive today in Turkey and East Africa. The ribs, we can go all day about the difference between horses and the, the hyrax, okay? Tulsa Zoo finally took down their display because 2,000 people signed a petition saying, get this lie out of our zoo. They took it down for six months and then put it back up when nobody was watching. Peabody Museum still has the horse evolution on display. Now, it's only been proven wrong for 55 years. I know it takes a while to get displays up to date in your museum. <laughs> but 55 years is long enough in my book, okay? Putting, leaving that thing in the zoo is stupid. Or in a university, it's not true. I was in a debate one time and this one professor, I was going through lies in the textbooks. I said, get that out of the textbooks. It's not true. He said, well, finally, he said, well, what are you going to replace all this stuff with? <laughs> now that's stupid. I said, are you telling me we can't take a lie out of the textbooks unless we got a replacement? What you're trying to say is, folks, we want the kids to believe this theory. We've got to give them some evidence, and this is all we've got, and you're taking away our evidence. Now you've got to find some more. Look, I didn't pick the dumb theory to begin with, okay? I don't believe it. Pick a new theory. That's the way science works. If you don't have any evidence for your theory, you get a new theory. The problem is, all the evidence for evolution has been proven wrong, but they don't want to take it out because there's no replacement. I'm not trying to get evolution out of the textbooks. I just want the lies out of the textbooks. Evolution will automatically go with it because there's nothing left to support it. The Bible says God formed the eye. Eyeballs are unbelievably complex. Charlie Darwin said to suppose that the eye could have been formed by natural selection, absurd. And then he goes for four chapters after that and says how he thinks it happened anyway. The back of your eyeball is one square inch called the retina. It contains 137 million light-sensitive cells, all wired to the brain. Now, my daddy started me off when I was about seven, building a ham radio. I've done a lot of electrical wiring in my life, built nine, built nine houses. I've done all kinds of electrical wiring. My dad was an electrical engineer at Caterpillar Tractor Company. I cannot imagine hooking up 137 million connections in one square inch. My heavenly father did it. He's pretty smart. I debated a guy named Ed Buckner, who's an atheist in Buffalo, New York. He said, the human eye is an example of poor design. <laughs> I said, why would you say that, Ed? He said, well, the eye is wired backwards. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the blood vessels are in front of the retina. I said, yes, I know that. I taught biology and anatomy. He said, well, the octopus has a much better eye because their blood vessels are behind the retina. I said, well, Ed, let me explain something to you. Um, we live in the air. <laughs> okay? Air is a very poor insulator for UV light. Okay? So your eyeball has the blood vessels in front of the retina because that's your body's last defense against ultraviolet light. Now, octopus live in the water. Okay? Now, water blocks UV light. See, we have eyes designed for living in air, and they have eyes designed for living in water. Now, if you want to swap eyes with an octopus, you just enjoy yourself, but that's <laughs> stupid, okay? You're going to be blind in a few weeks, all right? <laughs> what they're trying to say is, well, God wouldn't do it this way, so it must have evolved. That's a silly argument for evolution. They're trying to say poor design is proof of evolution. Porsche made a car one year. It was just a poor design. You could not get the spark plugs out without taking the motor mounts loose and lifting the motor up. That's a poor design. So does that prove nobody designed the Porsche? No. And they look at the human body today and think we are poor design. I say, first of all, fellas, you need to stop and consider something. What you're looking at right here is a copy off of a copy, 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 off of a copy of Adam. This same gene code has been copied so many times, it's amazing we can stand here and talk about it, okay? <laughs> You're not looking at the original by a long shot, okay? This one is, is a poor example of the original. <laughs> Getting worse, too, by the way, much poor example. Oh. It's stupid to say that poor design is evidence for evolution. The eyeball is so complex, you can walk into a room and look around the room, and in one second, your eye picks up enough information to keep the Cray computer busy for 100 years analyzing everything you picked up. 
fastest computer in the world. This textbook says the complex structure of the human eye may be the product of millions of years of evolution. That's stupid. The eyeball had to be designed. This textbook shows the kids a reptile eye and a bird eye. And it says, boys and girls, right here, you must picture or imagine how evolution happened. Yeah, we can line up these eyes. Can't you just imagine how one changed to the other? No. <laughs> the first debate I ever did, they called me up University of West Florida. I'd just been in Pensacola for six months, and I've been writing letters to the editor about the evolution in the, in the newspaper there. And boy, I stirred up a hornet's nest. I do that everywhere I go. Anyway, um, the university called me up and said, hey, would you like to come debate one of our professors? I had never had a debate in my life except with my wife, and I lost those every time. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? Come on, get your hand up, you coward. Put your hand up. <laughs> well, so I did. They, I said, what do I do? I don't, know, I, don't know, I don't know anything about debates. They said, you send us 30 questions, and he'll send us 30 questions, and we'll pick them out of the hat. I said, okay. I sent the question. I said, an owl has a cylinder-shaped eyeball like a tin can, like a telescope. The owl cannot move his eyes in his head like you can. They're not round. They're can-shaped, cylinder-shaped. He's got like a little telescope. When he's looking at you, he's looking at you, okay? He has to turn his whole head to look at something. Now, it gives him a disadvantage. He can't move his eyes, but the advantage is he can read the newspaper at the other end of the football field. <laughs> if he could read and he cared what's going on. I said, now, most eyes have a round eyeball. This one has a cylinder-shaped eyeball. Would you please explain to me how this evolved? And how did the bird see in the meantime when it was partway cylinder and partway round? <laughs> that question never came up, but uh, anyway. <laughs> so when they're telling you the eyeball evolved, that's, it's just stupid, okay? It's not common sense, okay? D uh, Michael Behe is not a young earth creationist, but he's got a great book out called Darwin's Black Box. I highly recommend that book if you want to study the complexity of things in nature. For instance, every little bacteria swimming around has at least one hair on it called a cilium. That little hair is attached to a rotary engine in the bacteria's skin. That little engine is so tiny that eight million of them would fit on the stump of a human hair. Cut your hair off, eight million motors will fit on a stump. Yet it turns 100,000 RPM and stops in one quarter revolution and goes backwards 100,000 RPM. I've done a little bit of motor work. I've had 128 cars in my lifetime. I've rebuilt the motors, the differentials, the wobble litter shafts, the Newton valves, the high-speed muffler bearings, filled the headlight fluid. I know how to work on cars, okay? Um, I can't imagine building a motor that would turn 100,000 RPM. And they think this little bacteria motor happened by chance? As things get smaller, the fluid they're swimming through feels thicker. It's called a viscosity problem, okay? So a bacteria swimming through his little world is about like a human swimming through peanut butter. And that little bacteria turning that little motor on the back of that thing can swim the equivalent of a human swimming 60 miles an hour through peanut butter. We've got a model of this thing in our museum. This textbook says humans probably evolved from bacteria more than 4 billion years ago. They can swim 60 miles an hour. Sign them up for the Olympics, man. You think we evolved from them? We're getting worse, not better. Now, that's just stupid, okay? Okay. <laughs> Uh, there's no kind way to say that. They say fossils prove evolution. I say, guys, you've got to be kidding. Fossils prove evolution? No fossil counts for evidence for evolution. None. Fossil record? There is no fossil record. There are a bunch of bones in the dirt. Now, you're putting your interpretation on them, okay? It's not a record. This guy says evolution is a fact, and the best evidence for evolution is the fossils. That's silly, okay? There is no fossil record. You cannot look back in the fossil record. You look at fossils in the present. You put your interpretation on them, okay? There is no fossil record. It's stupid to say that that's evidence. If you find a bone in the dirt, all you know is it died. You can't prove it had any kids that lived. You sure can't prove it had different kids. And why would you think a bone you found in the dirt can do something animals today cannot do, which is produce something other than their kind? No, the fossil record, that would not hold up two seconds as evidence in a court of law. This guy says, uh, I said this one, there are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. Stephen Gould said, the absence of fossil evidence is a nagging problem for evolution. We got a good theory. If only we had some evidence. Now, that's, that's just stupid, Stephen, okay? By the way, Stephen Gould with, died with a set of my tapes on his library shelf. I went to visit him, visit him a few years before he died. He wasn't there to talk to his secretary. 
Um, I sent, donated my videotapes to Stephen Gould years ago. Had him sitting on right there next to his desk. I hope he watched them. Hope he got saved. Maybe he did. I don't know. Hope so. But to believe that uh, we've got a good theory, we just don't have any evidence. Okay, well then, uh, maybe consider the theory might not be right. Okay? Richard Goldschmidt said, The first bird hatched from a reptile egg. <laughs> That's real stupid. Okay? Then they say, smaller is simpler. Well, that's silly, okay? Smaller is more complex. This textbook says, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. Excuse me? A primitive unicellular organism? If it's single-celled, it's not primitive. It's complex. That's stupid to say that's simple. One little paramecium is more complex than the space shuttle. And you can put thousands of those into a drop of water. Smaller is not simpler. Here's a microchip inside a paperclip. It's not simple. This ant is holding a microchip that is capable of processing all the letters in the Bible 200 times per second. Let's compare the brain of a honeybee to a NASA Cray computer. The honeybee is tiny. The Cray computer is huge. We'd all agree there's a size difference, okay? The brain of a honeybee is pretty small. The Cray computer can do 6 billion calculations per second. I think they got a faster one now. But the, the, y, the YMPC90 could do uh, YMP90 could do six billion calculations a second. It's estimated the honeybee's brain does a thousand billion calculations per second. The cray uses many megawatts. The honeybee uses ten microwatts. Talk about energy efficient! You know the, cray, the, the honeybee not only makes honey; he flies on honey. That's his energy source. And the honeybee can fly a million miles on one gallon of honey. How would you like a machine that gets a million miles per gallon? Hmm? Cray costs $48 million. The honeybee's brain is pretty cheap. You splat them on your windshield all the time. <laughs> Many people scramble to help babysit the dumb Cray computer. If it breaks, man, you've got to call in a whole crew to fix it. Honeybee has a self-healing computer. How would you like one of those? Cray weighs 2,300 pounds. Honeybee doesn't weigh too much. Let's see, the Cray computer is huge, slow, inefficient, costs lots of money, you've got to babysit it. But everybody knows it was designed. There isn't anybody with half a brain who would tell you the Cray came from an explosion in an electronics factory. <laughs> but they turn right around and say the honeybee evolved. That's stupid, okay? Smaller is not simpler. Smaller is more complex. And the brain of a human is a lot more complex than a honeybee. The human brain's unbelievable. You've got the memory capacity of the entire British Library. You have the computational power in bits per second greater than the entire national telephone system. The human brain is absolutely phenomenal. One evolutionist told me that he thought the human brain was nothing but three pounds of chemicals that arranged themselves by chance over billions of years. I said, then how can you trust your thoughts and the conclusions you've come to? <laughs> That's stupid, okay? Maybe, uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> DNA proves evolution. Yes, boys and girls, we have evidence from molecular biology. Percentage of DNA sequences is talked about here. It says, Darwin speculated all forms of life are related. This speculation has been verified. You think DNA has verified Darwin's theory? That's stupid. DNA is unbelievably complex. The DNA molecule in your body, the deoxyribonucleic acid, is the most complex molecule in the universe. If you took it and unwound 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 it, if you could ever get the thing untangled, it would be about seven feet long. And it would be like a twisted ladder. Each half of the ladder is called the genes. That thing splits all the way down the middle, recombines when you make a new baby, and it gets all back together. It winds itself all back up. Unbelievably complex. The average person has 50 trillion cells in their body. The DNA from all, if your entire body's DNA would only fill two tablespoons. But if you tied them all together, it would reach from Earth to the moon and back. Five million round trips out of two tablespoons. If you typed out the code found in your DNA, when you got done typing that incredibly complex code, you'd have enough books to fill Grand Canyon 40 times. Do you think that happened by chance? Well, the probability of just one DNA coming by chance is 1 in 10 to the 119,000th power, which is a big number, when you consider the entire visible universe is 10 to the 28th inches in diameter. DNA happened by chance? I'm sorry, that's stupid. Now, you might not like the idea of there being a creator because that means you might have to answer to that creator someday. Okay, well, I can't help you then. 
I did a debate at Embry-Riddle University a couple months ago, three against one, three professors against me. That was a slaughter. Those poor guys, I felt so sorry for them. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the next day, the student who organized the debate said, would you guys like to do that again? They said, no. <laughs> After the debate, we had a Q&A time, and one of, the, one of the kids said, I believe evolution's a fact. I said, well, let me ask you a question, son. Suppose, just suppose, creation was true. Suppose I'm right. Suppose there is a creator. And, and, he, and he owns this place. I mean, he made it. He owns it. Just suppose, okay? And he makes the rules. I said, would that change your lifestyle any? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, suppose the creator gave us a book like the Bible that says, thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Don't steal. No lust. No fornication. No pornography. Is this going to change your lifestyle any? He said, yeah. I said, well, then tell me. Have you accepted the evolution theory because you really have some evidence or because you like the freedom from God? He said, well, I've accepted it because I'm horny. I said, thank you, son. You may sit down. Uh. <laughs> Folks, there is no scientific reason to reject the Bible. There is no scientific reason to accept the evolution theory. None. Now, you might have a reason to accept the evolution theory because of your lifestyle. Well, then I can't help you, okay? But let me tell you, God created the heaven and the earth. God's going to come back and be the judge of this world one of these days. And if you haven't trusted Jesus Christ, his son, to forgive you of your sins, you're in serious trouble. You're going to stand before God in trouble. You say, well, I'm a pretty good person. Oh, yeah? You ever lied? How many have ever told a lie? Put your hand up. You're doing another one. Okay. <laughs> Bible says, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. How many ever stole something? Come on, you already told me you're a liar. Put your hand up, okay? <laughs> well, that's just two. We already know we're all a bunch of lying thieves, okay? <laughs> you think, people say, well, God's going to judge my good works against my bad. Who on earth told you that? Go to the judge and say, Judge, I only murdered one person. Look at all the people I didn't murder. Surely my good works outweigh my bad. <laughs> you better think that one through. And God will say, okay, I won't send you to hell for your good works. I'll send you there for the bad ones. Okay. <laughs> How about it? What if you die today? We're going to cover in the next session a bunch more reasons why evolution is stupid. And it is. But I think Satan is using this theory to blind people, to give them a placebo. Oh, I've got an answer to life. I know how we got here and God didn't do it. It's absolutely a stupid idea. And Satan's laughing at you for believing in it. And I got it probably, as, as Bill said, he wanted 100 more reasons why evolution is stupid. I started going through that thinking, I don't think I can trim it down to 100. <laughs> there are thousands of reasons why it's stupid. It just lacks normal intelligence. You know, it's common sense to look at something, when you find something designed, if I find a cell phone in the dirt, it's logical to say, somebody must have designed this. I don't have to see the designer. It's just logical there must have been a designer, period. Okay? When you're walking through the woods and you find a painting hanging on the tree, it's just logical to say, you know, somebody painted it. Even if you can't have any evidence of who did it. The painting is proof of the painter. The creation is proof of the creator. And if you're here today and you're not saved, the Bible says you're going to hell. You say, I don't believe in hell. You can go to hell without believing in it. <laughs> I won't affect God at all, okay? <laughs> If you're not saved, that's why we do this. Our ministry is called Creation Science Evangelism. We stand on apology, without apology. The Bible's true. And we want to use the evidence for science and creation to evangelize. If you're here and you're not saved, I want to talk to you. I'm not going to call you stupid to your face. But evolution is a stupid idea. Now, if you believe it, wise up, okay? Quit believing that stuff. We'll be glad to show you how to get saved after the meeting. Thank you so much. Well, it's an honor to be back here again, uh, teaching on more reasons why evolution is stupid. We probably could do a series, Bill, of 20 hours on this topic. Uh, but we only got one more hour, so we'll get done as quick as we can here. Why evolution is stupid. We left off in the last session talking about DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, the most complex molecule in the universe. To say that formed by chance is just plain stupid. But let's suppose it did. Chromosomes are the most complex molecule there is, and penicillin only have two of these chromosomes, these DNA strands. So they must have evolved first. And then slowly, over millions of years, they got some more chromosomes and turned into a fruit fly 
They have eight. Very slowly, over millions of years, they developed more chromosomes and became a tomato, or possibly a housefly. They're twins. It's very tough to tell the difference between these two. And then slowly evolved into a pea. And then over millions of years, it became a bee. Now there you can see the similarity. P, B, very similar. Okay. And slowly, over millions of years, we had triplets. Either the possum, the redwood tree, or the kidney bean came first. I'm not sure. Tough to tell them apart, folks. They all have 22 chromosomes, you know. There's, let's see, possum, tree, kidney bean. Let's see, possum, kidney bean, evolution. Oh. And then slowly, slowly, over millions of years, we evolved enough chromosomes to be a human. Here we are with 46. If we can just get two more, <laughs> we're going to be a tobacco plant. I know some already smell like it. Sometimes I'll get on the elevator and I'll say, man, you're evolving. You're way ahead of me. <clears throat> and maybe someday we'll have enough to be a carp. And it probably won't happen in my lifetime, but maybe star date 34, 95, 72, we'll have enough chromosomes to be a fern. Why don't they talk about the chromosome number as, order, uh, as evidence for evolution? Hmm? They tell the kids, 20 kinds of amino acids, that's true, make up all the proteins. It says, explain how this fact supports the idea that all life shares a common ancestor. Well, that's like saying all the books in the library have the same 26 basic letters. Uh, that's a good point. You see, boys and girls, that proves they all evolved from Morse code. Uh, no, teacher, somebody wrote those books, okay? <laughs> that's just stupid to say that the fact that we all have 20 amino acids is proof we're related. See, the reason God designed it where we all have the same basic amino acids that make up the proteins is so that the brown cow can eat the green grass and give the white milk and I can drink it and get the blonde hair. <laughs> See, if we didn't have all the same basic building blocks, we could only eat each other. Hmm. Think about it. Well, let's talk about evolution. I believe the hamster evolved first. They only live about two years. And then slowly, over, this is based on longevity now, slowly evolved into a cat and then a canary. They're very similar. You can see the li li lifespan. And then a dog and a chimpanzee, they're slow. You know, this is the real order of evolution. We, f the humans are near the top. Turtles actually live a slightly longer than humans, so they're probably the most evolved species on Earth. Or maybe we should arrange animals in order based upon their uh, top speed. The peregrine falcon is the most evolved animal in the world. Below that's the cheetah, then the antelope, the coyote, the ostrich, all the way down to the garden snail, 0 0.03 miles an hour in high gear. Or maybe we should arrange the animals in order of how they evolve based upon their gestation period, how long they're pregnant. Elephants are the most evolved. They're pregnant 21 months. Hamsters only half of a month, 15 days. Maybe we should arrange the animals in order based upon their body weight. The blue whale is the most evolved. The shrew at a quarter ounce, the least evolved animal. I mean, they just make up these charts to say how we evolved. They say the humans and the orangutans are 96% similar in their DNA. And that proves a common ancestor 15 million years ago. Well, now, hold on a minute. Barney Maddox was the leading, leading genome researcher on the DNA project. He said, folks, the difference between the human and his nearest relative, the chimpanzee, is at least 1.6%. He said that doesn't sound like much, but calculated out, that's a gap of 48 million nucleotides, and a change of only three nucleotides is fatal to an animal. There is no possibility of change. They used to think we were 98.4% similar. They've now discovered it's actually 5% difference. So there are hundreds of millions of differences between humans and chimpanzees. His nearest relative, the chimpanzee, that's stupid, okay? Now, some of my ancestors swung by their necks, no question, but none of them swung by their tails, okay? Now, arranging animal, animals in some kind of fictitious order doesn't prove anything. All they're doing is doing this on paper. Even if they find them in order, it wouldn't prove anything. I mean, if I get buried on top of a hamster, does that prove he's my grandpa? <laughs> Even order of burial wouldn't prove anything. But I've been doing research on the evolution of the fork. I've put together fragmentary evidence for a long time. I believe over millions of years, probably the spoons evolved. It's quite obvious. You can see the difference there. And I believe the knife evolved to the spoon and then slowly became a four-tined fork. And if you break one off, it's a three. <laughs> and if you break another one off, it's a two and then a wonk. Okay? But, uh, I felt like I had, I knew I had it right, but I felt like I had a missing link. I found it one day flying to Connecticut on U.S. Air, the missing link. <laughs> so the evolution of silverware is becoming very complete. Mm -hmm. yeah. A lot of mutants didn't survive. 
When people found out I was researching the fork and evolution, they sent me all kinds of frauds. I mean, people are trying to get famous, okay? They were hoping for fame and fortune. This was an obvious fork head on a spoon handle. But I, my trained scientific eye caught it right away. That was a fraud. Of course, a lot of variations of races appeared along the way. Um, look, you can, turn the, you can turn a cat to a cot to a dot to a dog, changing one letter at a time. You can play around with this for a while and turn yourself into a fool if you're not careful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now they tell the kids dinosaurs turn to birds. The Bible says the birds are made on the fifth day, reptiles made on the sixth day. You know, everything about the evolution theory is backwards to the Bible. Every single thing is backwards. The Bible says man brought death into the world. Evolution says death brought man into the world. The Bible says God created man. Evolution says man created God. I, it could not be more opposite. This guy says, scientists, dinosaurs are alive as birds, scientists says. Oh, wow, scientists says. Well, that's proof of something, isn't it? That's stupid, okay? Dinosaurs are not alive as birds, okay? Textbook says, birds are the descendants of dinosaurs. Yeah, all you got to do is put a few feathers on them and give them a shove, man. It's not that hard. <laughs> man. They say, Archaeopteryx is proof of evolution. Archaeopteryx is the missing link. Yes, boys and girls, there it is, the missing link. Archaeopteryx is a bird. A 100% bird, a perching bird. Now, textbook says, Bird feathers evolved from scales that protected the dinosaurs. You think feathers evolved from scales? That's stupid, okay? Feathers are incredibly complex. Scales are folds in the skin. They just attach to the skin differently. They develop from different, different genes on the chromosome. They're both made out of keratin, and that's where the similarity stops. Feathers did not evolve from scales. There's no similarity at all. I like to show this to evolutionists. This is, as far as I know, the world's largest rock group. And I'll say, now, guys, do you think there's any chance that George Washington's face could have appeared on the rock, you know, just by chance? Do you think the wind could have done that with abrasion or exfoliation or thermal expansion of the rock or erosion? I mean, what caused his face to appear on the rock? They'll say, well, that was designed by a guy named Borglum, and he, he, he built it. I say, right. Now, I'll say, guys, do you think that George Washington himself, the real person, happened by chance? They'll say, oh, yeah. I said, wait a minute, you don't think his face could appear on a rock by chance, but you do think his entire complex anatomy with 50 trillion cells and probably 20 redundant interlocking systems happened by chance. Are you dumb in any other area? <laughs> Had to be designed, man. They tell the kids in the textbooks, plants adapted to their environment. Yes, gills are an adaptation to living in water. Oh. Why don't they use the word designed? And by the way, how did the fish live before they adapted the gills? Oh, well, you see, for millions of years, they all died. None of them lived. Oh. That's stupid, okay? Gills are not an adaptation to living in water. They're designed for living in water. But they don't want to use the word design because then some kid's going to say, who's the designer? They don't want to deal with that question. They somehow think, all you got to do is get the molecules together and add energy and you can make life. Oh, let's try that. Let's put a frog in a blender and turn it on. <laughs> in a matter of seconds, you will have frog nog. <laughs> you will have all of the molecules required to make a frog in one place. Right? Now you can put it on puree. You can nuke it, microwave it, zap it, hook jumper cables to it. I don't care what you do to it. How long? You can add all the energy you want. How long will it take to reassemble the frog? <laughs> it's not going to happen, okay? Putting molecules in, together and get, adding energy does not create life. That's stupid, okay? It has to be designed. They say homology proves evolution. I don't think so. Yes, boys and girls, one of the evidence is homologous structures. They'll say, you've got two bones in your wrist, the radius and the ulna. Yeah, look at this. The dolphin has two bones in his flipper. Wow. It says right here in the textbook, these homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. They do this in all the textbooks all over the country, all over the world, actually. Yes, boys and girls, this is comparative anatomy. Comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonalities suggest that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. That's stupid. They probably have a common designer. You know, the same guy designed them all. Not a common ancestor. Then they say we've got evidence from development. Yes, boys and girls, the human embryo, as it grows in the mother, has gill slits, they say. Darwin considered this the best evidence in favor of his theory. Made up by a guy named Ernst Haeckel, who called it the biogenetic law. 
Their phrase back then was ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. In other words, the baby developing in the mother goes through the stages of evolution. Fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal, farm, F-A-R-M. Well, the idea that sick mind Freud relied on was the idea that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Uh, what? This textbook says, the presence of fish-like structures in embryos of different species shows these animals evolve from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. It's as if the embryo retains a memory of its origins and copies them during its development. This is stupid. They say the baby has gills like a fish. Humans do not have gills like a fish, okay? Those little folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing, okay? I've seen folks that have five or six chins and they cannot breathe through any of them but the top one. <laughs> Those are not gill slits. Ernst Haeckel made up that whole stupid idea in 1869. Uh, anyway, we can skip all this. We won't have time. Uh, but you know, you can't get a high score on the SAT or ACT or college entrance exam. All of the major tests in, in college, to get, enter college, you have to answer with evolutionary answers or you score lower. Huh, interesting. I got all the 2004 tests and looked at them. They're teaching this all over the place, that the embryo has gills. It's stupid. It was proven wrong in 1869, 1875. Get it out of the books. It's not true. This textbook says the humans have an appendix that is vestigial. You don't need it anymore. That's stupid. You need your appendix. It's part of your immune system, okay? If your appendix is taken out, you're going to have a serious problem. Now, sometimes you have to take it out. I understand, okay? It beats dying. But the appendix is required to activate killer B cells in your immune system, just like the thyroid activates killer, activates killer T cells. If you take your appendix out, you've got a much better chance of getting quite a few diseases. It's not vestigial. Just because you can live without it, so what? You can live without both your legs and both your arms and both your eyes and both your, both your ears also. Doesn't prove you don't need it. This textbook says the whale has a vestigial pelvis. Yes, boys and girls, the whales have a vestigial pelvis and leg bone that serve no purpose. Just imagine whales walking around. It's true. Well, these are the bones they're talking about right there. Just imagine the whale walking around. <laughs> Almost all whales have these. You know, I have tried to imagine them walking around, and I can't. It says, the whale's pelvis is evidence of its evolution from four-legged land-dwelling mammals. That's stupid. Those little bones are anchor points that special muscles attach to that allow the whales to reproduce. Without those special muscles and those special bones, you don't get any more baby whales. We've got in our museum in Florida a 15 and a half foot python snake skin. If you look at the south end of that snake skin, it's got two little claws attached to little tiny bones that go up inside the snake's body. Come down and see it, Pensacola, Florida. Textbook says these are rudimentary hind legs of a python snake. Reduced hind legs. That's stupid. Those little claws are used in mating, okay? The snake doesn't have any arms, all right? And you can't talk and say, screw it over, honey. This has nothing whatsoever to do with walking on land, all right? It has to do with getting baby snakes. That's stupid, okay? Get that out of the book. Textbook says, humans have a tailbone that is of no apparent use. That's stupid. I was in a debate one time, and this atheist said, Hoven, I got proof for evolution. Humans have a tailbone they don't need anymore. I said, Mr. Patterson, I taught biology and anatomy. I happen to know there are nine little muscles that attach to the tailbone, without which you cannot perform some valuable functions. <laughs> I won't tell you what they all are, but trust me, you need those muscles. I said, now, I said, I said, Mr. Patterson, if you believe the tailbone is vestigial, I, Kent Hovind, will pay to have yours removed. <laughs> Bend over. He did not volunteer. <laughs> Textbook says the coccyx is a small bone at the end of the human vertebral column. It has no present function and is thought to be the remainder of bones that once occupied the long tail of a tree living ancestor. <laughs> this is what your kids are being taught in school, folks. Look, I hate to say this, but the problem in the textbooks is not fixable in the short term. Get your kids out. The ship is going down. Get them out. The tailbone is not, you say, I can't afford it. Well, sell the car and get a bike, okay? Sell the house and get a tent, okay? But get them out, okay? Tailbone is not vestigial. This one says the Colorado River, over millions of years, the Colorado River carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Colorado River cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. 
Well, the these two, you guys know what snow lines are here in Denver. The red lines indicate the snow line. There's a ridge in between those lines. The river enters on the far right and flows downhill 270 miles and comes out the other side through the Grand Canyon. If you do a schematic view, it looks like this. The river is 2,800 foot elevation when it enters the canyon. The, ca the, river, the, the ground goes up as high as nearly 8,000 feet, 8,500 feet above sea level. A couple things to consider about this. The top of the canyon is higher than the bottom. <laughs> the river only runs uh, through the bottom. The top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by 4,000 feet. Rivers don't flow uphill. There is no delta. Nobody knows where the mud is that washed out of there. That river did not make that canyon. Grand Canyon's a washed out spillway from a couple of big lakes. So when the textbook says the Colorado River carved it over millions of years, that's stupid. Unless they got a river that flows uphill, doesn't work. Textbook says, boys and girls, the layers of rock are different ages. This one's 70 million years old. They say the layers of rock are different ages. Now hold on a minute. All over the world, petrified trees are found standing up connecting these rock layers. If you get petrified trees standing up connecting a bunch of rock layers, I don't think it's logical to say the layers are different ages. How long does a dead tree stand up around here in Denver before it falls over? You know, four or five years? No, these layers are not different ages. It's just not possible. That's stupid. Okay, the layers all formed during the flood in the days of Noah. All over the world are bent rock layers. It's pretty hard to bend rock like that. They say the layers are different ages, and yet they're all bent with no... Uh, fracture marks in the layers. I mean, if one layer was deposited on top of another one, the bottom was going to be hard eventually before the other one. And here we are seeing these twisted bent rock layers all over the place, and they're trying to tell us the layers are different ages. Well, maybe by a few weeks or months or minutes during a flood. But to say the layers are different ages when there are no internal fracture marks is just plain stupid. They're not different layers. They all formed in the flood in the days of Noah. They got bent while they were soft. This guy says, the rocks date the fossils, but the fossils date the rocks more accurately. <laughs> That's stupid. They teach us that the, the fossils are sorted by how they evolve. You know, clams are found at the bottom because clams evolve first. And birds are found at the top because birds evolve last. Well, moving water sorts things automatically by all sorts of factors, okay? Actually, maybe fossils are sorted based upon their habitat. You know, it could be the clams are found at the bottom because... They're already at the bottom when the flood starts. You know, that's where they live. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're sorted based upon intelligence. As far as anybody can figure out, clams aren't too bright. Maybe they're sorted based upon mobility. Did you know clams can't run very fast? Maybe they're sorted based upon body density. Maybe it's a combination of all those. Don't tell me they're sorted by evolutionary process. That's stupid. They look at erosion marks like a Bryce Canyon and say, oh, yeah, it took millions of years. See all that erosion? Wow. Millions of years of erosion. Oh, uh, wait a minute. That's a pile of dirt in my backyard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here's millions of years of erosion or along a highway built a few months ago. Ancient seabed. Look at all the, you know, buttes sticking up there and pillars and columns. Oh, millions and millions of years of erosion. All you got to do is fly out west and look out the window of the airplane once in a while, and you'll see huge erosion marks all over the place. You know, the very simplest things could not evolve. It's an excellent, it's a very simple book, so cute. We sell it in our, our ministry uh, called Exploding the Big Bang, Could a Box Evolve? Could just a cardboard box evolve? And there's a whole chapter explaining how cardboard boxes are made. Is it possible that a cardboard box could evolve? How about an ink pen? How about a paper clip? It just takes some simple objects and shows how dumb it is to think that a human body could evolve. But the textbook says, all the many forms of life on earth today are descended from a common ancestor found in a population of primitive unicellular organisms. We all evolve from a bacteria. That's stupid. The blue whale grows to 49 tons in one year. That's a growth rate of 330 billion times from what it started. If humans did that, you'd weigh a lot. Blue whales slowly tried to evolve this ability over millions of years. None of them survived, of course. They all died. Blue whale evolved from a bacteria. That's stupid, okay? The seahorse, the only fish that swims in the upright position, and the male hatches the eggs. Interesting. Where did this evolve from? Who's its ancestor? This evolved from a bacteria? That's stupid, I think. Sperm whale can dive 10,000 feet, stay there for two hours underwater. You know the pressure at 10,000 feet is 620,000 pounds per square foot? 
As the sperm whale slowly tried to evolve this ability over millions of years, none of them survived. They all died. The whale? Sperm whale evolved from a bacteria? I'm sorry, folks. That's just stupid, okay? The platypus, what did it evolve from? It has hair, lays eggs, senses electrical signals, and it preys muscles. When, it's, when the crawdads are trying to crawl away from this thing, the, the muscles contract. The, this thing can sense the muscle contraction in the crawdad. Bats, with their echolocation, can sense a moth and go pick it out of the air, but the moth can hear the echolocation and drop. How did the moth evolve that? How did the bat evolve the echolocation? The platypus evolved from bacteria? That's it's just stupid, okay? Bottlenose whale can dive 3,000 feet down in two minutes. Try that. Watch what happens to your eardrums. A human attempting this would have multiple medical problems and die almost instantly. <laughs> that's evolved from a bacteria? I'm sorry, that's stupid. Rhinoceros beetle can carry 850 times its own weight. That's like me carrying 17,000 pounds. What did this evolve from? Who's its ancestor? You think it evolved from a bacteria? I'm sorry, I think that's stupid. You can believe that if you want, but don't call it science, okay? The giraffe has a two-foot heart that pumps blood up 10 feet. Then when it bends down to get a drink, it's got a special blood cushion to absorb the shock of all this pressure being pushed down to its brain. The giraffe is getting a drink. He hears a lion roar. He throws his head up in the air 17 feet and runs off. Go from zero to 17 feet in about a quarter second, and you try to run off and see what happens. <laughs> you take about three steps and fall over. Did he fall from a bacteria? I don't think so. The woodpecker has a tongue that was in the back of his head, goes all the way around, anchors in his left nostril. No other bird has a tongue anything close to the woodpecker's tongue. What did it evolve from? Who's its ancestor? It has shock absorbers around its brain to absorb the shock. The woodpecker can peck the tree, back its head out, open its eyes, focus on the tree, close its eyes, and peck again. If it had its eyes open when it pecked, its eyeballs would pop out. It can open its eyes, focus, close them, and peck like, what, 40 times a second? What did it evolve from? But from a bacteria. Uh, I think that's stupid, okay? The beaver, amazing animal, has its teeth that the outside is hard, the backs, the inside of the teeth are soft. Every time they chew, they wear off the inside of the teeth, which means the outside is always sharp. Self sharpening teeth. Pretty slick. It's an, en an engineer of amazing ability. The beaver can cut down a tree limb and swim across a river. Here he is carrying something with a heavy drag, he's swimming. He's compensating to know that he ends up in the right spot without being carried downstream by the extra drag of this branch. Yeah, for millions of years, they all got washed downstream and died. <laughs> None of them survived. Yeah. Came from bacteria. I, think, I just think that's stupid, okay? The golden plover goes to Alaska, lays its eggs, puts on 70 grams of fat, raises the babies for a few weeks, and then it takes off and flies 88 hours nonstop to Hawaii. It burns one gram of fat per hour. It's only got 70 grams. It needs 88 grams to make it. So they fly in V formation, and they're always switching who's the leader. The leader takes the brunt of the airflow. All the rest of them save enough energy that they land in Hawaii using only 70 grams of fat. Several weeks later, the babies take off from Alaska and fly to Hawaii. They've never been there. What did it evolve from? How did it make it? Evolved from a bacteria. I think that's stupid. Okay, I think it was designed. Dragonfly is the most amazing insect on the planet, I think. They have the best eyes of any insect. They have up to 30,000 eye lenses. They can see almost all directions. They can fly frontwards and backwards. They can fly 20 miles an hour. They spend a year at a year and a half, as a, two years as a larva. Then they develop into adults. Unbelievable. Just study the dragonfly. It'll blow your mind. Evolved from bacteria? I think that's stupid, okay? Then they talk about carbon dating as proof for evolution. Well, when they first invented it in 1949, the lower leg of a mammoth dated 15,000 years old, but the skin was 21,000. <laughs> uh, it's not working, okay? 1963, living mollusk shells dated 2,300 years old. Still not working. 1970, they said, if a carbon date supports our theories, we put it in the main text. If it does not entirely contradict them, we put it in a footnote. If it's completely out of date, we drop it. They pick the dates they want. 1971, freshly killed seal, carbon dated 1,300 years old. It's not working. 
1975. One part of a mammoth is 40,000 years old, another part is 26,000. You talk about a slow birth. <laughs> and we could spend all day on carbon dating. Uh, living snails carbon date 27,000 years old. It just doesn't work, okay? You can go all through history, it doesn't work. This guy says, in the last two years, an absolute date was obtained for the Gandong beds. It has the interesting value of 300,000 years, plus or minus 300,000 years. <laughs> That's stupid, okay? Not only is the theory stupid, it's dangerous. Charlie Darwin said, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. If evolution is true, has one type of man evolved farther than the rest? Henry Fairfield Osborne said, the standard average intelligence of the average adult Negro is similar to the 11-year-old youth of the species Homo sapien. Do you mean Negroes are not Homo sapien, Henry? That's stupid, okay? Thomas Huxley said, no rational man, cognizant of the facts, believes the average Negro is the equal, still less the superior of the white man. That's stupid. The Mormons teach uh, that the uh, Negroes don't have, they used to teach anyway, that they could not be saved. They were cursed with the curse of Cain. That's stupid. Ernst Haeckel said, the mental life of savages rises little above the higher animals, especially the apes with which they are gene genealogically connected. Their intelligence moves within the narrowest bounds, and one can no more or no less speak of their reason than that of the more intelligent animals. These lower races, such as the Vedas or Australian Negroes, are uh, psychologically nearer to the mammals, apes or dogs, than to civilized Europeans. We must, therefore, assign a totally different value to their lives. That's stupid and dangerous. But if you've seen the movie Quigley Down Under, where they called Quigley Down to come shoot the Aborigines, that's exactly what was happening. They were killing Aborigines. They thought the Australian Negroes were inferior. These two folks went down there to collect skulls for museums. Article right here says, uh, The New South Wales missionary was a horrified witness to the slaughter by mounted police of a group of dozens of Aboriginal men, women, children. Forty-five heads were boiled down, the best ten skulls packed off for overseas. They killed them to get their heads for museums to show evolution. 1904, World's Fair was held in St. Louis. 2,000 primitive people were put in dis on display to show evolution, how that the pygmies slowly evolved to the modern white man. Oda Bengo was taken away from his wife and two kids and put in a cage with chimpanzees. He was a pygmy from Africa. He went insane and killed himself. Thomas Ro or Theodore Roosevelt thought the Indians were an inferior species because he thought they hadn't evolved as far. You won't understand what happened to the Indians until you realize what happened with the evolution theory teaching this stuff, that some of the races are more important than others. Roosevelt said, I wish the wrong people could be prevented entirely from breeding. He thought the Indians, or the immigrants from Europe, Scotland, Ireland, or the Orient were a threat to American society because they were inferior. How many of you have ancestors from one of those places? See, you're inferior, yeah. 1871, Congress scrapped all treaties with the Indians because they thought, you know, they're just animals that they hadn't evolved as far. You've got to read about the Trail of Tears. Of course, evolution came out way before 1859 with Darwin's book. Darwin just made it popular. It's stupid to teach that Indians or anybody else is inferior. Comrade Stalin went to a Christian school as a kid. He read Darwin's book and became an atheist. Darwin's book changed his life forever. Comrade Stalin killed between 60 and 100 million of his own people. You ought to read any of the books by Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Somebody gave me one once. Said, "Well, Hovind, you got to read this book, the Gulag Archipelago." I said, "Man, this thing's 900 pages." He said, "Well, just read the first five. I said, "Okay." Three days later, I finally got to go to bed. I said, "Man, that was an awesome book. <laughs> I couldn't put it down." It's stupid to say that somebody's inferior because of their skin color or something else. During World War II, the Germans were, uh, overran Poland from one side. The Russians overran them from the other side. They captured all the Polish officers and executed them. The Russians finally admitted this, that 14,700 Polish officers were executed at one forest. They put hoods over their head and shot them in the back of the head because they thought they were Poles. They were inferior. That's stupid and dangerous. Paul Pot, the leader of Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, killed you know, a third of his entire population because he thought he, had, you know, he was trying to speed up the process of evolution. That's stupid. Read about the killing fields or Khmer Rouge, what happened over there. When Mao Zedong took over China, they killed 60 million people. 
when he took over China. He wanted to speed up the evolution process. It's stupid, folks. Adolf Hitler's mind was captivated by evolutionary thinking, probably since he was a boy. Evolutionary ideas lie at the basis of all that is worst in Mein Kampf. Hitler thought the Jews were criminals because they were breathing air and drinking water and eating food that belonged to the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Aryans. He said, nature does not desire the mating of weaker with stronger individuals, even less does she desire the blending of a higher with a lower race. Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, talks about racial crossing all over the place. Higher races. Who's a higher race, Adolf? Hitler thought the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegians were close to pure Aryan. Did you get all that? The blonde-haired, blue-eyed Norwegian. Board and start a dilly dog. Yeah, sure. Hey there, fella. Oofta. And he thought the Germans were mostly Aryan. The Slav Mediterraneans are slightly Aryan. The Slavics are half Aryan, half ape. Orientals are slightly ape. Black Africans are mostly ape. And Jews are close to pure ape. That's the list Hitler was working off of. He hated the Jews. He also hated the blacks. Olympics were held in 1936 in Germany. Jesse Owens, the black American athlete, won the most gold medals. Hitler said, it's not right to make my men race against this animal. Well, Hitler, that's stupid. He's as much a man as you are, probably more. Textbook says you're an animal. Kids, don't you buy that for a second. That's stupid. You're not an animal. I've seen some look like it, okay? <laughs> I've seen some act like it. <laughs> you're not just an animal. You're made in God's image. You're going to answer to God one of these days for everything you've ever said or thought or done. Arthur Keith said, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. We don't want to believe this theory. Well, that's a stupid reason to go to hell because you don't like the theory of that God might have made the world. Julian Huxley said, I suppose the reason we leapt at the origin of species was the idea of God interfered with our sexual mores. That's stupid. The Bible says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do things which are not convenient. That's dangerous. But can you imagine if God gave up on you? Wow. Maybe you're here today. Somebody dragged you here and said, oh, you've got to come to this meeting. I want you to come. And you, you believe you came from a rock 4.6 billion years ago because that's what you've been taught in school. God is not willing that any should perish. But to accept the idea that you came from a rock and to reject the idea that God created this world, I, it's just, it is stupid, okay? I'm sorry. There's no kind way to say it. The Bible says God cannot lie. He promised whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that's smart. What, that's the deal of the century, the deal of a lifetime. God says, here, I'll take all your sins, throw them as far as east is from the west, and I'll give you my righteousness on your account. On account of, you don't have any. <laughs> That's what I did 35 years ago, 36 years ago. I said, Lord, I'm a sinner. He said, you can say that again. I said, Lord, uh, I deserve to go to hell. <laughs> he said, you can say that again too. I said, but Lord, I want you to save me. I want you to forgive me based on what Jesus did. Wow, he did. He do the same for you. Let's summarize here. God made this world. He owns it. He makes the rules. And we're guilty of breaking his rules. He told us pretty clearly, don't lie. We've all lied. Don't steal. Or you've stolen. You can read the whole list and find out we're guilty. We're going to have to be punished or find a substitute. And that's where Jesus comes in. 35, 36 years ago, I asked the Lord to come in my heart and save me. What if you died today? Where would you go? If you're not sure you're saved, you ought to think about it. You're going to be dead for a long time. I mean, a really, really long time. And if you're not sure you're going to heaven, I think it's stupid to get out on that highway. Have you seen the way they drive here in Colorado? <laughs> Man, you have got some rednecks moved out west here, folks. I'm telling you what. <laughs> I'm going to die someday. I'm going to try to make it the last thing I do, but it's going to happen can happen to you too. All you get is that little bitty dash between two dates. My recommendation would be you take your little dash and say, Lord, uh, you can have it. You can do something with it. What are you doing with your little dash? The guy who's third in the nation got, in racing motorcycles got saved in my seminar. 
He came to the next, next year when I was preaching up there in Connecticut. He said, hey, Brother Hovind, I'm so excited. It's great living for the Lord. He said, uh, let me take you to breakfast tomorrow. I said, that'd be great. He said, I'll bring one of my bikes. You can test drive it. I said, okay. I've got a Honda 250. <laughs> he brought his Honda 900 that had been blueprinted and stroked and bored and balanced, and I'm not sure what all they did to it. But it was not your normal Honda 900. He said, try it out, Brother Hovind. I said, okay. I took it off in first gear. Boom! Just about broke my neck. I hit second gear. Boom! I was just about to drop it into third when I glanced down and realized I am going 90 miles an hour in second gear. It has six gears. <laughs> I brought it back. I was shaking like a leaf. I said, how fast does it go? He said, I don't know. <laughs> but guess what he wants? A faster bike. Hey, the people that have 80 pairs of shoes in their closet, do you know what they want? More shoes. People that have a big house, guess what they want? A bigger house. People that shoot the 10-point buck, guess what they want? They want to shoot a 12-point. People that have a million dollars in the bank, guess what they want? More. It takes us a whole lifetime to figure out things here aren't going to satisfy. They just aren't. I'll tell you one thing I found that satisfies. Give your little dash to Jesus. Say, do something with this. You can have it. One little boy came to Jesus one day and said, Jesus, you look like you're hungry. You've been out here preaching all day. You can have my sack lunch. I ain't got much. I only got five, five biscuits and two fish sticks. <laughs> Jesus said, well, son, I can have the whole thing. He said, yeah. He said, well, son, sit down right there. Watch this. Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women plus children out of that one little boy's lunch, including that little boy. That's pretty cool. He could have kept his lunch and fed himself, but he decided, he decided to give it away. And he still fed himself and 20,000 more people, plus brought home 12 baskets full of fragments. You just can't beat a deal like that. Now, you can save your little life and use it for yourself if you want. That's your prerogative. I don't care what you do. You can work hard and make a bunch of money and die rich. <laughs> okay. You're going to die either way. Or you can give your little dash to Jesus. Say, Lord, would you do something with this? Some of you need to start a ministry. I'll tell you what. Denver needs a creation museum. Go to visit Red Rock Amphitheater. I went up there one day and there's all these dinosaur footprints on the hillside. How many have been up there? Red Rock Amphitheater, you know the dinosaur footprints? I stopped up there looking at these dinosaur footprints on the hillside and this, uh, this old man was standing up there. He's looking at them, you know. Pretty soon a school bus stopped. And a bunch of kids got out. And this old man walked over and said, Hey, boys and girls, I'm a member of the club called Friends of the Dinosaurs. Let me tell you about these dinosaur footprints. He said, Millions of years ago, dinosaurs were walking along the beach and they left their footprints, and they hardened. And then over millions and millions of years, the mountains lifted up, and now the footprints are at an angle like that. After the kids got on the bus and left, I said, Hey, do you own this property? He said, No. I said, well, Who does? He said, Well, it's a state property. I said, Now, do you, do you get paid to do this, to give these tours to the kids? He said, No. I just volunteer my time. I said, So you don't own the property, and you just volunteer to do this? He said, Yeah. I said, Okay. Next school bus stopped. <laughs> I was a little younger and could run a little faster. And I got there first. Hey, boys and girls, let me tell you about these footprints. About 4,400 years ago, there was a flood. Every, the whole world was in panic. Noah had all the critters safe on the ark, but the rest of the world, it was disaster. And some dinosaurs were running, trying to get away from the flood. And these footprints got covered up with mud and preserved. And then during the last part of the, part of the flood, the Bible says in Psalm 104, the mountains arose, the valleys sank down, the water rushed off. 
And these mountains formed about 4,400 years ago in the flood. That guy was so angry. I thought he was going to have a heart attack. I know CPR, but I thought, you know. <laughs> if you're a Christian, what on earth are you doing for heaven's sake? Everybody ought to find something to do. People say, Hovind, did God call you to start a ministry on creation? I don't know. I never got a letter or a phone call. <laughs> it just needs to be done. Now, kids, you go to sleep. You won't understand this. Kids, you may go to sleep. Parents, you'll understand. You know, mom can wash the clothes, dry them, fold them, and set them by the bedroom door. The kid comes in and doesn't even see them. How many know what I'm talking about? Now, come on. Didn't, didn't you see those clothes? Uh-uh. I think God's up in heaven looking down at some of his kids, maybe some in this room. Can't you find something to do for my kingdom? You know, witness to somebody. Give them a gospel track. You say, oh, I don't want to drive them off. What are you going to drive them off to? Hell number two? <laughs> find something to do. We can help any way we can. That's what we're here for. Thank you so much. Dismissed.